Hey there, and welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast. I'm your host, the Grand High Poobah of all things Wingnut, Darla Jethro Powell. And today we are joined by a beautiful and very successful interior designer. You all probably know her, and I am sure you love her, Dala Al Fuweris of House of Form. And we are going to be going over all things profit first right? It's been a hot minute since we've covered that topic. Dala is going to walk us through how she applies the profit first method to her interior design business to make sure her people are getting paid, to make sure that she's making profit in the business. And most importantly, probably at all of us, that uh, she's getting paid, that we're getting paid. And she has her own little spin on that system. And I think you're going to really appreciate that. Some great takeaways and tidbits there. But uh, before we get into the mini news and my interview with Dala, I have some housekeeping. Okay, so Wingnut Academy is launching our Instagram courses for interior designers, hopefully by the end of this month in May. I'm recording this at the beginning of May. There's beta testing and all that jazz going down. So go head on over to Wingnut Social com and uh, sign up for the announcements there wingnut academy and don't forget to register for our very next wingnut webinar and that is going to be ah, may 24th at 11 a.m with the lovely delightful divine and brilliant nicole heimer of glory and brand and nicole is going to be going over inserting personality personality you know life into your brand to attract high-end clients and believe it or not it is not uh, counterintuitive it is not a oxymoron and it doesn't cancel <laughs> they don't cancel each other out she's going to have a lot of tips and tricks with how to align your messaging in such a way to appeal to higher-end clients a lot of designers are under the misconception that if they show personality or if they're transparent or authentic or themselves they're going to turn off high-end clients i'm here to tell you high-end clients are people they're human they're carbon-based life forms so nicole heimer going to have a lot of terrific tips to help you with your messaging and marketing your interior design business and that way and branding really it all relates to that and that's wingnutsocial.com uh, wingnut academy check the the drop down there for wingnut webinar to register for that and of course it's 100 percent free zero clams no doll hairs free 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 and if for some reason you are unavailable and you cannot attend on may 24th at 11 a.m don't worry register anyway and the replay will be sent out to you you cannot beat that with a stick whether it be large or small all right you guys know what time it is it's time for mini news mini news sesh yeah, yeah. so lisi what do you have for us today on the docket facebook actually announced a new feature that they are testing. It's not out for everyone yet, but basically there are going to be little bubbles um, that essentially look like the story bubbles on Instagram or another app, but they're going to be in the notification tab of Facebook and they are to notify you whenever one of your friends posts something new and when you click on it, it'll take you to all of their recent posts, which is kind of interesting. Okay, very cool. It kind of sounds a little bit like TikTok. So it kind of is. And basically, Facebook is trying to get more users because we all know that, you know, TikTok has come in and really changed the game as far as social media goes. And so Facebook has said that they've lost some users, but hopefully this is going to bring them back and kind of I don't know, increase engagement. So we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Facebook really is struggling to keep people engaged on their app. And it's really shown in the data too that TikTok just keeps going up and up in terms of engagement and Facebook is going down. So I feel like they're kind of trying to do everything they can to test new new features like this to try to keep people on the app. Absolutely. I, I don't know. I'm trying to think if I would use it personally. I know that is it is available to iOS users, um, to some iOS users right now. I don't have it yet, but I'm not sure how helpful it'll be. I'd honestly just rather have the chronological feed to kind of see in order. But, you know, it might be nice. It, it kind of reminds me of Instagram's like close friends feature in that, you know, if you're close friends with someone, you can like just see their stuff. And so I'm thinking it's an easier way to stay in touch with family, friends, people that you personally know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And as of now, it doesn't look like uh, business pages have access to this feature, but if potentially it comes to the um, Facebook app in the future, that could have 
really good implications for, you know, your Facebook page exposure in the future. Yeah, I think that would be, I think it would be great for businesses. Um, I know I personally tend to like, I follow pages on Facebook or I join groups, but I don't always see the posts that, you know, the businesses post and stuff. And so I think having it in one place might be really good. So yeah, hopefully that'll come to business pages. Right. Totally agree. So um, everyone, uh, keep an eye out for that feature. Tell us what you think about it and if you find it helpful. And we will see you next week. Thanks, Lisey. Man in new sash. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's get into my conversation with Dala Alfuweris. But first, I have to tell you all about her. Dala Alfuweris is the owner and principal designer at House of Form. Terrific name, by the way. The Scottsdale-based boutique design firm that specializes in creating memorable spaces and meaningful experiences for guests and customers. With degrees in interior design and fine arts, Dalla brings more than a decade of design experience to every hospitality and retail project from locally owned restaurants to national rollouts. We're talking big time people. Help me in welcoming Dalla Alfuweris to the show. Hey there, Dalla Alfuweris. Welcome to the show. It's so good to see you again. Hi, how are you doing, Darla? I am doing spectacular. In the green room, we were talking about how it's been, what, two years? Two years or so? What, when was Luann live? Has it been longer than that? Oh, I think it's been longer than that. It was pre-pandemic, so it must be three or four years. Oh, my Oh my! God. It seems like yesterday. Yesterday and 40 pounds ago. <laughs> I know. <laughs> COVID-20, I think we all experienced that. COVID-15. <laughs> I gained the, go- the COVID-40, I think. <laughs> that menopause, um, divorce, and uh, a move will do that to you. So, so Dal, I'm really excited to be speaking to you today for a myriad of reasons, but also because the topic that we're going to cover is um, a topic that we haven't covered in, God, forever. And we're going to be talking about the profit first method for running your business, for, you know, in a financial way. And I love that we're going to get the perspective from an actual interior designer. So, you know, not a CPA or or that kind of thing. So we're going to talk about how using the profit first method has impacted your business for the the better, I'm assuming. So uh, before we get into this conversation, just tell me a little bit for the uninitiated what profit first is and we'll, we'll walk them through. Sure. So Profit First is uh, based on a book by Mike McCallowitz, and it's basically a accounting system for people that don't do accounting for a living. And there's many of us, especially designers, right? We, we think with our right brain, we're creative. Um, so it's a great tool. But essentially, it kind of turns the idea of profit on its head. Most of us have been taught that you take your profits from your earnings, you subtract your expenses, and whatever is left over is what you gift yourself or, you know, use towards um, salaries and such. But this says, that's not why you started the business. You started the business so you could profit. So how about we take your earnings, we subtract your profit. Whatever's left over is how you operate your business. Um, So it really kind of shifts your mentality to start to run your business very lean. You're not just spending for the sake of spending, you're spending for the right reasons and you're getting creative with how you spend because you don't have infinite amount of money. What do you mean? What, there's not infinite amounts of money. <laughs> I mean, I wish Uh-oh. there was. <laughs> I like I I use profit first method in a kind of a hybrided kind of way. I don't have, and we'll get into the the accounts and and everything that you use for your business. Maybe you do the same, but I have three different accounts. I'll have one for operations, one for payroll, and one for savings, or I call it gravy. Okay. Ooh, gravy. I like that. Right, right, gravy. Yeah, leftover. And uh, since I have been doing that, it does keep my feet a little closer to the fire, although I do tend to think that there is unlimited money sometimes. That's my... (laughs) my, (laughs) But I, before I started doing that um, and really kind of started looking at the business and the financials, I wasn't really making sure that the profit was a priority, that I was getting paid as an owner. And, um, you know, since the ownership of the company and everything and I had more uh, control, I had a partner in the business before and when I could do it my entire self and I took control of that, that, is, that has changed a lot. So um, before we get into like the structure of Profit First and how it's helped you, do you think that it's more of a an attitudinal kind of mindset thing in front of you or is it also a logistic help 
if that makes sense. I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah, no, I totally understand the question. So from a logistical standpoint, it's really easy for me to log into my account and look at each designated account, which we'll get into, I guess, in a little bit, and know exactly what funds I have available in each bucket. So I can make really informed decisions fast. And one of the biggest ones has been hiring. Do I have enough funds um, looking ahead to the next three or six months to cover one additional full-time hire? And I can almost answer that question before I even speak to my CFO. Of course, she validates it for me because she looks at numbers a different way, but this is a quick way for me to evaluate. Um, From the other standpoint, I think it just gives me structure to run the business the way I'm supposed to run it to be successful. So I I kind of have an easy guide point that says, all right, once a check comes in right away, you know how to distribute the funds. Okay. Are you using an online banking account for that? Or are you getting penalized for having different accounts? And and then, then we'll get into which accounts you do have. Oh, yeah, I love this question. So I bank with Bank of America, and naturally, they charge you for multiple accounts. So what I did was when I implemented this method, I went to the bank and I said, hey, I'm about to open about six accounts. If you can't give them to me for free, then I'm going to move to another bank. But if you can work with me, I'll stay here. And they worked with me. So <laughs> well, that's, good. that's how I got the gazillion accounts. There you go. That's the approach, the, the Dala approach. Dala, uh, Dar- Darla and Dala. I'm like all tongue-tied over here. Okay, so what are what are the accounts? How many different accounts do we need to set up? What are what are they entitled? Are they are they consistent or can we just make this up? What does that look like? Sure. So I would say just as a, to preface this, read the book for Mike McCallowitz's method. Of course, every business operates slightly differently, so you have to make modifications to work for your business. So I'll just say that this is my method. Um, but essentially, I have four accounts. Um, I have something called OPEX, which is the operating expense account. I have something called tax, which is where I put my tax distribution. Um, I have something called owner's pay, which would be my salary as the owner of the firm. And then I have an account called profit. Um, And that would be a percentage that I set aside for profit. So each of those accounts is broken down into a different percentage based on the performance and the revenue of your company. So I actually reference Mike McCallowitz's chart for where I fall in terms of annual revenue, and that helps me determine how I distribute the funds. Um, I'll give you an easy one, but for profit, I'm setting aside 10% of every check that comes through. So it doesn't matter where the payment is coming through every Friday, I call it Financial Friday, I spent the first hour of the day distributing those funds that have come through during the week. Tax, for instance, I'll set aside exactly 15%, which relieves so much stress when it comes to tax. I'm sure everybody has gone through some sort of situation with taxes. I know I did very early on because I never set enough aside or I paid too much and you kind of want to be in a happy spot. Um, But what I do is I set that money aside and at the end of each quarter, I can make my quarterly payments and I don't have to worry about where the money is coming from. It's literally coming from my tax account and going directly to the IRS. That's got to give you tremendous peace of mind. You'd be able to sleep, right? Is that something that um, Bank of America can just like say if you get you get a check through your payment account, which would be your operating account, I'm assuming, that they can just automatically say, okay, 10% to profit, 15% to taxes, or you have to do it manually? That's a good question. I'm going to ask the bank. I never even considered that. Um, You know, even if they did, I might actually hold on to that exercise because it's a way for me to check into my finances every week. That's true. Yeah. So you can be accountable and actually see what's going on. Okay. Very good point. Because I was like, I would like to automate that because of course I'm in marketing and we like to automate everything. Yes. I love to automate everything too. (laughs) Trust me. But you just (laughs) talked me out of it because I I am the kind of person that needs to see in black and white, hey, it's not magical money. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's stuff actually going in and going out. I definitely, uh, I, I definitely tend to fantasize about. <laughs> I know that for sure. Okay, so you have four accounts. I think in the book profit first, he recommends doing uh, a couple other accounts as well. But that it, it gets a little overwhelming, right? I, th- I have, I told you, I have the three. So, are you pulling payroll out of the OPEX? Yes. Um, okay. So I'll summarize what each account is for. Profit uh, is relatively easy. It's basically bonus fund that you could put towards 
advancing your business in whatever form you want. It can go towards marketing. It can go towards, you could give yourself a bonus at the end of each quarter. Yeah. The OPEX account is for anything that involves operating expenses of the business. So my, my payroll minus my payroll as an owner comes out of that account. Um, our lease, our computer programs, you know, um, anything you can think of that is considered an expense to the business. Sure. If I'm taking the team out for lunch, it's coming out of that account. Um, tax is obviously tax and owner's pay would be what I set aside, which is also a percentage of every paycheck. 90%. <laughs> oh, I wish. <laughs> I, I like it. I like that you've customized it for you. So me, I have to have a separate payroll account. If I had it in operation, operating expenses, I, I'm afraid I would get those too twisted because we use a lot of, well, you know, I, I mean, you have a lot of operating expenses too, but we have a lot of different software programs and stuff. And uh, God forbid I take out too, too much and my people don't get paid. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I, I like that a lot. So before you were doing the profit first, what were you just doing checks in, checks out? And how has implementing this philosophy affected your bottom line, do you think? Yeah. So at the very beginning, before even being introduced to this, I literally had one account. Things were going in and out. I wasn't on payroll. I had no idea what my salary was. Salary was whatever was left over at the end of the month that could go home with me. So there was really no rhyme or reason or method. Um, I think what has happened is when you go through the exercise of divvying up all this money into various accounts, you realize what your revenue needs to be to meet the the goals that you have for your company. So if I want to grow my team to seven people, understanding how this bucket of money is divided allows me to say, okay, to be here, I must make X amount. Um, so that's how it's helped. It's really put me in check and allowed me to evaluate very carefully before I make big decisions. Had you always been paying yourself? Even like you said, it, there's a little bit left over at the month. Maybe it's $100, maybe it's 1000 maybe it's $10,000. That's always how you had been doing it? Or were, were there some months where you were like, uh, maybe I don't get paid this month, but now that you're doing this, you're finding that to be a thing of the past? Yes, a little bit of both. So I, we've been in business for six years now. It was year one that I had zero rhyme or reason. <laughs> it was just survival, right? But year two is when I put myself on payroll. And it was a low amount, no doubt, because I was just getting started. And I was using the profit first method, which really said, hey, if you want to pay yourself more, you got to up the profit. Um, so year by year, I was able to increase that. And I think since year two, so for five years, I have been on payroll just like the rest of my staff. Yeah. And same thing. When I first started my business, I wasn't. I was hiring because I, I didn't have um, some of the skills like the CAD or the computer stuff. So I, I knew that in order for me to have the interior design firm that I wanted, I had to fill that need. So it was more of an investment in my business. And um, it wasn't really until I started taking control of my own finances and doing the profit first that I started regularly being on my own payroll. And it, it's funny how... Um, when you do that and you make it a non-negotiable that you make the money to cover it. <laughs> yes. Right. If you need any motivation, this is the motivation. <laughs> yeah, you you have to you make you make that money to cover it for sure and that was uh, it was just magical in that way. It's like, okay, here's the owner draw, here's here's all the different things and 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 um divvying it up in that way made a huge difference. And so that's why that's where I was coming from with the mindset versus, you know, the logistics question as well, because you're like, man, I'm, I'm you know, I'm on payroll, my bookkeeper's going to do it. So it's, it's got to be in there. Yeah. So you did mention that um, the 10% for the profit, you're like, Oh, you know, some of that could go to marketing. Is that where your marketing's coming out of your profit? Uh, no, actually, no. And <laughs> okay, I, I'm good. glad you brought this up, because I, I have a story to tell about how profit good, really... I was going to yell at you. No, no, no. Mark Marketing actually comes out of our OPEX account and we have budgeted a certain amount for the year. I would say it's for any extracurricular things that, you know, at the end of the year you decide, ooh, I really want to do this for my business. Pizza party. Party, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, where it came in handy actually was in March of 2020, I signed a lease on a new office for our team and it required a full build out. 
And I don't love taking out loans. I will when I have to. But if I could cover it myself, fantastic. And guess where that money came out of? The profit account. So I was able to build out an entire office um, without having to take out a loan. I like that. That is great. I don't like taking out loans either. Again, if I have to, okay, fine. But mm, I'd prefer not to. I I don't like it. I don't like it at all. So what is what a percentage of uh, your overall, would you say is your marketing budget? Just curious. Yeah, I would say probably two to 5%. Yeah, that, that's pretty healthy. Two is a little low, right? But five five to seven is usually is the average for an established designer. So that's pretty good. You're right in there. You're right in that target. Oh, awesome. Good. What is your most effective form of advertising? I will add to that that we have in-house marketing. So we have social media that's handled in-house. So that helps alleviate the, the budget that we have set aside. Um, but we do a number of things. So we will pitch to a lot of magazines. And oftentimes you have to pay to enter your project into a competition. So there's that expense. Um, We take very good care of our clients and that's part of a marketing um, expense too. We always have a welcoming gift and a gift at the end of our project. Um, We will host events throughout the year where we allow people to come together that are in our network, whether it's potential clients or industry professionals that are our peers. Oh, okay, this is, I don't know if you'd consider this marketing, but I very much believe in a a happy team and a team that's rewarded for all their hard work. So every quarter we do it big and we do an event that um, we can all enjoy. The last one that we did was a makeup class by a celebrity makeup artist. Oh, how cute. I love that. Yeah, so... That, that's fun. And of course, that kind of turns into a marketing thing because we share the behind the scenes with our fans and followers. Right. On social. I like that you mentioned social media first. So there you go. Good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> oh, social is definitely our, I would say social media is our, our visual portfolio. So we do share a lot of our work, but we also share a lot about the team and the behind the scenes of our, just, Yeah. Perfect. Sorry, I got on a little tangent because I'm a marketing geek. Okay, so back to profit first. With this interrupts, we're done with the interruption for the marketing. So profit first, let's say, um, what would be your best advice for someone out there to get started to research to even see, uh, to look at their business, look at their finances, if they're going to do this on their own to see, okay, I can put this amount towards each of these accounts. And um, what if they're not, what if they're not actually profitable just yet? What, What do you... What kind of advice would you give there? Yeah, so I would say start by reading the book um, or talk to talk to peers that have implemented it and can share some insight. I have some friends that did not want to bother with reading the book, so I broke down exactly how I used it. Um, so start there. Second, implement it and maybe... If you're, if you're not quite profitable, this is the push you need to make you profitable. So I would say move forward and use the method and you'll see that in, in a month, maybe two months, you're going to start to see a profit because you're being forced to think differently about the finances of your business, not just the money coming in. You're going to think about how you charge your projects. Yeah, and what you need to charge in order to get to that, even that 10% or, or all the different little tiers. That you're, it really does help to visually break it down. And if you have any kind of mindset or you're, if your head is in the clouds you know, with your finances, there's, there's really no escaping that in the breakdown. Okay, so they're out there, they have they have their accounts together, they have their, their payroll accounts, their operating accounts, their tax accounts, and they're paying themselves. What are they looking at? I imagine it's along the same lines, but what are they looking at to, maybe they want the profit to be 20% or 15% or 25%. How do we look at that? Ooh, I, I would say talk to a CPA or (laughs) or a financial (laughs) advisor. I feel like 20% might be high for profit. Okay. Um, Okay. But, but that's, that's based on where our business is today. Okay. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about why. um, So you're an interior designer. You do a lot of commercial work, right? So let's talk about why, why you think that is so. So I think that's going to be enlightening. I think naturally a business's highest expenses is the operating expenses or payroll specifically, right? Um, And to move your business forward, you need those additional team members to help you progress and get to that next level or next stage in your business. Um, So I would say a good chunk of the amount is in the operating expense and a good chunk should also be in your owner's pay or owner's draw. Um, because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're happy and taken care of and, you know, you're being rewarded for 
starting the business and, and building it. Um, so that's probably why I think it scares me to hear 20% for profit because um, I'd rather reallocate that to rewarding myself and rewarding my team fairly. Right. And, and that makes sense. And because uh, without our teams, right, that would put us in quite the bind. So we want to keep them happy. So the, there are two schools of thought that I've that I've heard as well. Um, I don't know if you had uh, if you've read the book Built to Sell. It's a it right. It's, so it's a book, and I highly recommend it out there if if you guys are looking to um, build up a business to sell it. Um, I don't know if that's in your plans or not. We we haven't talked about that, but that if you want to sell your business, that you can't be um, uh, the income can't just be you know operating payroll. You're paying yourself and no profit, which is not your case. You're making a profit. So for another business to buy your business, you have to show that above and beyond paying yourself, that the business is making a profit. Because when they buy your business, you as the face of your business, if if that's the case, if you're listening, has to be replaced. So what you're paying yourself doesn't count. You know what I'm saying in that equation, an equation for the value of the business, because they're assuming they're going to have to replace that position for that same salary. So I was just, I was just curious about that, and um, I don't want to. If I, if I, this is too much of a personal question, then just tell me and we'll edit it out. Is, is that something that you see ever doing down the road? Is selling your business or building it up or, or segueing, or this is it for life? I, I do see that in the future, but it's probably ten years from now. But thank you for planting a seed. It's something I never considered, and I can see now. If I were to purchase a business. I would definitely want to see a higher profit margin. But to clarify, this is where I don't want to get too complex, but I do have a CFO who respects and appreciates that I use profit first for my level of understanding of finances. But when she reviews my numbers, she's using her method and she will show us how profitable we are at the end of the year. And it's usually between 20 and 30 percent. So that reads very differently than me divvying up my funds and putting 10% into a profit account. Right. Okay. And, and yeah. Okay. I see that makes sense. So 10% would be like the minimum. This is the the rainy day pizza party. Okay. Got yes. It. Yes. And you know what else I love about, um, just since I got off on another tangent about selling your business is that your business is, even though it's Dala Alfuweris, right? The business is not named that. It's called House of Form. So I think you're set up beautifully if that is something that you ever wanted to do. Can I tell you about that though? Because that was a, a very calculated change that I made during the pandemic. Um, the company actually used to be called Fuweris. Justin Interiors, which is a combination of my last name and my husband's. And I, I just, remember. do you remember this? Yeah, FJI. It meant nothing. I mean, maybe to me, but not to anybody. And there was no, there was no sex appeal to it. And we're in the hospitality industry. We need to have a name that on its own stands as a representation of our brand and what we can offer. So I took the pandemic period as the perfect time to say, okay, we're going to come out of this as a new, uh, not a new image, but a name that matches the image that we've built up. And that's when we became House of Form. Mm -hmm. I love the name. It's really, really, really good. Thank you. Uh, It's terrific. Yeah, you're you're well, well positioned. Dala, is there anything I've forgotten to ask you about uh, Profit First before we get into the What Up Wingnut Round? I would say um, use Profit First for a couple of years and then pull in a CFO or financial advisor to evaluate it from a different perspective. We've kind of hit a sweet spot right now where we're using a combination of that and my CFO's knowledge um, to be in a very great place. So I would say that could be the next step once you've gotten comfortable. Awesome. I love it. All right. Now I have to ask you, are you ready for the What Up Wingnut round? Yes. Now it's time for What Up Wing Night. Wing Night. What would the hashtag on your tombstone be? Step out of your comfort zone. Hashtag step out of your comfort zone. The only way you grow. Yes. <laughs> right? If you're stuck on a deserted island, but you can have your favorite food forever. What's it going to be? Um, sushi, more specifically salmon sashimi with a raw quail egg on top. That sounds, you know what? Normally I'm like sushi, there's fish on the island, but in this case we will accept it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, recommend us a book that has uh, had a profound impact on you either personally or professionally. I think I have an idea what it could be. Yeah. Now I sound like a broken record, but it's definitely profit first. It is the single book that has truly transformed my business from a profit and um, mental standpoint. I love it. That's quite an endorsement. And that's by Mike Michalowicz, who I swear was in Monsters, Inc. (laughs) (laughs) That's 
hilarious. <laughs> the little blue man, green man, <laughs> the little green one-eyed guy, right? Am I? Am I mis? I might be misremembering that. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Dala. Please tell the audience where they can go out to find more about you and House of Forum, and we will call it a day. Sounds good. So we are on Instagram as at House of Form underscore, um, or you can visit our website at houseofform.com. And you could send me an email at hello at houseofform.com if you have any questions about Profit First. You might, they might take you up on that. Are you ready? Oh, I'm ready. <laughs> I, I love to help. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you, Darla. It was fun talking to you. How lovely is Dalla? She's just the most beautiful human being inside and out. I remember meeting her at Luann Live. Gosh, when was that? When was that, Luann? 2019? <laughs> I don't even remember. It just seems like yesterday. Like I said, yesterday and 40 pounds ago. Just the most lovely, gracious, down to earth, really, really, really sweet person. My kind of gal. I love her. If you ever get the chance to meet her in real life, you're going to say, you know what? Darla was right. Dala is amazing. And her name is amazing. Short one letter, but you know, we won't hold that against her. So I love that she was able to walk us through how she adapted Profit First for her own business model. She doesn't have a million different accounts. She has the ones that are important for her. And I think that that's the beauty of Profit First. You can read Mike Michalowicz's is <laughs> the plural Mike Michalowicz is this, is this book. And, um, you know, I think it's okay to adapt it for yourself once you have the fundamentals down and she has the CFO and she has all the people for that. So I don't think that, that is a bad idea right there. And uh, straight from listen, she's clearly very successful, right? She's, she's the, she's, she's the big league, her, her design firm and she is as well and she's only been in business six years and she was she was very clear about how much of an impact this method has made on how she runs her business from a financial standpoint so go check it out I mean if it ends up not being your cup of tea at least you read it at least you tried it at least you know maybe you maybe you break it down to two bank accounts payroll taxes wait that's three <laughs> and operating expenses or maybe it's you know hey let me do a separate account to make sure my ass is getting paid that's super important wouldn't you say i would say all right that's it for today remember to head on over to wingnutsocial.com and register for the nicole heimer webinar that's going to be a fun time she's a good friend of mine so that's going to be fun is it too early 11 a.m is that too early to have drinks nicole uh, maybe. <laughs> and if you need help with marketing your interior design business, anything digital, whether it be search engine optimization, social media marketing, you name it, we do it. Uh, wingnetsocial.com. It's a full service social media marketing firm and uh, the like. Check out our reviews and testimonials on the website. Very compelling. Uh, we had clients who were so thrilled that they were kind enough to do video testimonials so you can see their real life clients. <laughs> who've had great success with us. We didn't just make them up. All right, that's it for this week. Remember, get out there, get uncomfortable, and be great. If you need help with your social media marketing, if you're overwhelmed, you have no idea what to post, you need a strategy, or you just need it done for you, we got you. We are doing that daily, and we went through.